Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's Word and God's Sacrament. This morning we're going to begin our service with a, with a baptism of uh, Hunter and uh, Hudson. I can't even say the right name. Get out of the way now so I don't mess it up later. Yes. <laughs> We've already baptized Hunter a few years ago. So, uh, so exciting to have uh, uh, welcome Hudson into the family of faith here through Holy Baptism. And then we're going to focus on our Gospel reading, which uh, in today's circles can be quite a controversial reading, but what I think is most important is what Jesus says to the woman at the end of our text, How Great Is Your Faith. We begin our worship by singing our opening hymn, Here I Am, as printed in your bulletin. We turn to page 268 for the rite of holy baptism. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promised whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter has written, Baptism now saves you. The Word of God also teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How is your child to be named? Hudson Andrew Hammerley, receive the sign of the cross both upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, according to your strict judgment, you condemned the unbelieving world through the flood. Yet according to your great mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his hosts in the Red Sea, yet led your people Israel through the water and dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of holy baptism. Through the baptism in the Jordan, your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold Hudson according to your boundless mercy and bless him with true faith by the Holy Spirit, that through this saving flood all sin in him, which has been inherited from Adam, and which he himself has committed since would be drowned and die. Grant that he be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the holy Christian church, being separated from the multitude of all believers, and serving your name at all times with a fervent spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believers in your promise, he will be declared worthy of eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From ancient times, the church has observed the custom of appointing sponsors of baptismal candidates and catechumens. And the Evangelical Lutheran Church sponsored to confess the faith expressed in the Apostles' Creed and taught in the small catechism. They are, whenever possible, to witness the baptism of those they sponsor. They are to pray for them, support them in their ongoing instruction and nurture in the Christian faith, and encourage them toward the faithful reception of the Lord's Supper. They are at all times to be examples to them of the holy life of the faith in Christ and love for the neighbor. Is it your intention to serve Hudson as sponsors in the Christian faith? God, enable you both to will and to do this faithful and loving work, and with his grace fulfill what we are unable to do. Amen. Hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. They brought young children to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord preserve your coming in and your going out from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Because Hudson cannot answer for himself, we as the body of Christ will answer these questions for him. Do you renounce the devil? Wow, we are on a roll. Are we renouncing the devil or not? Okay. Do you renounce the devil? Do you renounce all his ways? Works. Do you renounce all his ways? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried? He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? 
All right, Joel and Stephanie, do you desire Hudson to be baptized? Hudson Andrew Hammerly, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given the new birth of water and of the Spirit, has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. Receive this burning light to show that you received Christ, who is the light of the world. Live always in the light of Christ and be ever watchful for his coming, that you may meet him with joy and enter with him into the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which shall have no end. In holy baptism, God the Father has made you a member of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir with us of all the treasures of heaven in the one holy Christian apostolic church. We receive you in Jesus' name as our brother in Christ, that together we might hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you have graciously preserved and enlarged your family and have granted Hudson the new birth and holy baptism and made him a member of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as he has now become your child, you would keep him in his baptismal grace, that according to your good pleasure, he may faithfully grow to lead a godly life to the praise and, glory, praise and honor of your holy name and family. Finally, with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. You guys, uh, we've got a, got a certificate here. Book. Okay. And you can blow that out whenever you want. And you guys can return to your seats. I now invite any children forward for a special message. All right. Oh, come on up, you guys. Come on up. Have a seat. Have a seat. Yep. Have a seat. All right. Good morning, friends. All right. It's good to see each of you here today. Do you guys know what I have here? A globe. That's right. And what does a globe do? It spins. Yes, yes, it does. Yep. What else does a globe do? What is a globe? Yeah, it's, it's a picture of the Earth. It's a map of the world, right? Right. This globe shows us the oceans and the seas. It shows us the continents and the countries on them around the world. Yeah, pretty cool. This is really cool. This is Mr. M's, all right? So it really spins. It has longitude and latitude on it. It's t almost too fancy for me. All right. Yeah. All right. So um, there's a lot of places on this, but I want to point out one place in particular. OK. So that place we're going to start is right here. All right. See where my finger is? See where it is? All right. My finger is right here. OK. That place is Israel. That's where Jesus was born. Why was Jesus born? He was born so that he could die on the cross to pay for our sins and then rise from the dead so that all who believe in Jesus have forgiveness and life eternal with him. So 
is Jesus just the Savior of Israel? No. Is Jesus the Savior of Poland? No, he's not? Well, yes, he is. He's just not only the Savior of Poland, right? Is he the Savior of Canada? Yes. Is he the Savior of Mongolia? Yes, he's the Savior of every country in this world. Every country we find on the globe, Jesus came to be their Savior. And he came to be your Savior and my Savior. Let us pray. Lord God, what an amazing world you made. And you sent your son Jesus to be the Savior of us all, of every country, every tribe, every people, and including us. Thank you for what an amazing gift we have in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks. You can return to your seats. Our Old Testament reading for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, the 56th chapter, verse 1, and then verses 6 through 8, on page 784 in your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along. Our Old Testament reading reminds us that foreigners, non-Jews, would be included in God's kingdom, and that God has a plan to save all people from every nation. Isaiah proclaims, Thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come, and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes to us from the 11th chapter of Romans, a whole bunch of selected verses. The first, first verse 1, the first part of 2, verses 13 through 15, then 28 through 32, beginning on page 12, 12. And our epistle reading is Paul's continuance of his struggle about his fellow Jews not believing in Jesus. Although he is an apostle to the Gentiles, Paul remains hopeful for his brethren because God is faithful in his promises. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the Gospel reading. And the Holy Gospel is according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter, verses 21 through 28, on page 1049. And our Gospel reading is Jesus coming across a Canaanite woman who has a sick daughter. Jesus is clear that he's come for the lost sheep of Israel. But this woman's persistent faith amazes 
Jesus. We read, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. We continue our worship by singing, Make Me a Servant. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would Jesus say that you have a great faith? What would it take for Jesus to say those words about you? Great is your faith. Shouldn't that be the point of our gospel reading for today? These last words of Jesus to this woman. Woman, great is your faith. This account of Jesus has become a lightning rod in today's society. It's interesting to read commentaries because they, they seem to tiptoe around what people might try to say today about this text. Many people will go and say what is not happening in this text more than what is actually happening between Jesus and and this woman. I mean, how could they not? We live in 21st century America that's become a nightmare of Karens and cancel culture, and this might be the story that some might try to make to cancel Jesus himself. After all, Jesus comes across a Canaanite woman. Her daughter is demon-possessed. She's down on her luck. She would have been more of an original person to this land than the Jewish people were. Jesus tells his disciples that he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then Jesus doubles down on this idea when he says something outrageous to our ears. It's not right to take the children's food children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And he calls this hurting, desperate woman a dog. And it's not in a good way. For many people today, that would get Jesus canceled or worse. People have called Jesus a racist for this statement. Others have even foolishly said, see, Jesus makes mistakes too. These are not good ways to look at this text, by the way. 
Reading this text is extremely hard because of the history that we have as Americans in our own country between different races and how our country has historically treated native people. Jesus could get canceled through the story because of that history that's around us. And we're constantly reminded of it. And I should stop here and make sure that you understand what I'm saying. All of this stuff is not good. Then, if you were to ask a fact checker about the claim and ask this question, did, did Jesus really call a woman a dog? The fact checker could come back in this way. Well, yes, this is mostly true. Jesus didn't address the woman as a dog directly, but when he used the analogy of giving food to dogs, this woman was clearly in mind. The analogy shows what Jesus really thought of this woman and his racist ideas come out of this story. But to continue this story with 21st century American eyes, I could hear the arguments on the other side today. That fact checker has a hidden agenda and it comes out in that last sentence. This feels like a setup against Jesus. This might be a plant. Could this woman be a deep state fake? After all, how could anyone at the time of Jesus claim to be a Canaanite? The Assyrians and then the Babylonians wiped whole groups of people off the face of the earth, especially in this land. Those that might have survived were assimilated in such ways that how could anyone by the time of Jesus consider themselves to be a Canaanite? I mean, it's only by God's grace that the Jewish people survived the Assyrians and the Babylonians and then the Greeks and then the Romans. And this destruction of these people took place five and seven centuries earlier. How could this woman know that she was a descendant of the Canaanites? That would mean she could trace her lineage back at least five centuries. For us today, that'd be like tracing your family history back to the Reformation days. Even with today's technology, that's still pretty sketchy, pretty difficult. How could this woman make such a claim back then in Jesus' day without such technology? So it's obviously fake news. It's a setup to make Jesus look bad. Cancel this woman. Cancel those who report on this story. Cancel anyone who disagrees with me. And when we bring 21st century American readings into this text, we miss so much of what's going on in this text. Let's start with the disciples. The disciples demonstrate that perhaps they had learned the, from the chapter before from the feeding of the 5,000. When they asked Jesus to dismiss this woman, if you look close enough at the Greek and Jesus' response, they're not just asking him to send her away and forget about her. They're asking him to send her away after he gives, him what, gives her what she asks. See, in the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples told Jesus to just dismiss those people. Let them fend for themselves. At least they've learned. Give her what she wants and send her away. Or we miss the woman's amazing response. She didn't get offended when Jesus gave a negative answer to the disciples. She didn't get offended when she was called a dog. Instead, she showed her faith in Jesus. When we get offended by this story, we don't even stop and ask the question, how does this woman even believe in Jesus in the first place? These details are important in this story. To see how that God's grace had worked in this woman's life to get her to this moment. And I think they're all given to us to make you ask that important question I asked at the beginning. Would Jesus say that you have a great faith? When you see many of your friends going in the opposite direction of you spiritually or ideologically, do you stick to your faith or do you follow along in the other direction? When the going gets tough, does your faith get going or do you get pouting? 
When someone says or does something wrong, does that give you an excuse to cancel them out of your life for good? Or does it motivate you to love that person more? Are you quick to forgive or quick to curse? Is there someone in your life that you have canceled because they don't deserve your forgiveness? Do more people know about your faith or about your hobby? Is it more important that people know your beliefs or your political party? Does your faith come out more or does your sinful side come out more? Do you trust in God above all things or is he just some guy to fill in the gaps in what is still missing in your life? Do your actions, when no one is around you looking, do they reflect what you believe or do they just serve yourself? Perhaps we should ask ourselves, what does a strong faith look like? What does the faith that Jesus commands appear to be like? How should we act? What should we believe? In this text, the Canaanite woman calls Jesus Lord three times. She even identifies him as the son of David. She believes that Jesus is the Messiah who was promised to come. And she comes to Jesus with her, her problems, with an expectation that Jesus can correct them. She's the one who follows an interesting pattern in Matthew's Gospel so far. If you go back to the beginning, Jesus is born, and here appears some magi following a star. And most Jewish first century readers would say, a magi, what are they doing in the story of our Savior? Those guys are stargazers. They like magic. They're magicians. They don't belong in the story of our Savior. And yet it's those magi that God reveals the truth that the king of the Jews had been born. Then a few chapters later, it was a centurion, a Roman soldier, who holds a faith that Jesus says is amazing. And now it's this Canaanite woman with a demon-possessed daughter down on her luck and someone who should have no idea who Jesus is. And it's the least and the weakest among us that sometimes demonstrates the greatest of faith. Then they demonstrate this great faith because the Holy Spirit has revealed the truth of Jesus to them. Do you have a faith that Jesus would commend? Do you call Jesus Lord? Do you see him as the son of David? Do you believe he's the savior of the world that had been promised long ago? Do you believe that he died and rose for you? Do you believe that his crumbs are all that you need? Do you sometimes feel foolish or out of place amongst God's faithful people of the church? Then the answer is a simple yes. Yes, you have faith that Jesus would commend because the Holy Spirit reveals these truths to you. Yes, your faith is great. When someone's sick among you, you turn to the Lord in prayer and you ask him for mercy and believe he can do something. When you need hope, joy, comfort, or peace. You turn to Jesus because he's the great source of hope, joy, comfort, or peace. And although you're far from perfect, you still have that steadfast faith. A faith that doesn't waver in times of trouble because Jesus didn't waver for you. Rather, he offered his life on the cross for you. He rose from the dead for you. He gives you a place in his kingdom that lasts forever. And when you live out your faith, you might look more like this woman than you might want to admit. You might look weird or foolish or weak or strange or even be hated. But again, it's the foolish and the unexpected people in Matthew's gospel that we see faith fully demonstrated. And it's in those days, it's in those times, it's in days like today, with cancellations all around us, 
where Jesus says to you, Great is your faith. In the name of Jesus, amen. We now continue our worship with the gathering of our offering. We continue our worship with our prayers. And our prayers this morning, remember those this in our bulletin. We also include, continue to include March, Marge Klossner as she uh, rehabs uh, from some, some, uh, some physical ailments. And we also pray for uh, Bruce, that is Sue Howe's uh, cousin, who is gravely ill. Please stand for prayer. O oh Lord, bless this congregation and church. Grant that it may be a house of prayer, and we of people of prayer. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, grant that the church may steadfastly proclaim your irrevocable gifts and calling, that the disobedient may receive mercy, and that those who hear would become grafted unto Jesus Christ, the true vine. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, bless all honest work and occupations, and grant that we may use well the fruits of our labors. Give us generosity for those in need. Bless the tithes and offerings that accompany our sacrifice of praise. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, what a great gift of holy baptism you've given us, salvation through Christ alone. We especially give you thanks that Hudson has been called your child through the waters of baptism. Help many more children and adults be called to you through the waters of holy baptism by the great gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, grant that the government and those who protect us might keep justice and do righteousness for your name's sake and according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, care for those who cry to you, whether beset with grief, sorrow, pain, or trouble, including Marge, Bruce, Ruth, Janet, Eileen, Jane, Stacy, David, Jerry, Helen, Carol, Helen, Marilyn, Shirley, Bridge, Elmer, Marion, Phil, Sarah, and Allie. Be pleased for Christ's sake to answer them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, help us to pass down our faith in you to the children of our families, church, and community through this church and through Trinity Lutheran School. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, bless all who are about to receive Christ's body and blood from this altar. Grant that these crumbs from your table may strengthen us in faith and love, united with you and our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated.
Please stand for prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you refresh us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his favor on you and give you peace. Amen. And remain standing as we sing Shout to the Lord. Please be seated. Well, it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's Word and God's Sacrament. An exciting day to, to welcome Hudson through the waters of holy baptism. Hunter, you want to help me out with announcements? <laughs> All right. Um, just a couple of announcements. Next Sunday is our outdoor service with picnic. So it's a potluck. We'll have bingo afterwards as well. Um, we'll have some uh, chicken ranch uh, 
or some chick. See, I, I always do this. Pizza Ranch Chicken will be there as well. Uh, will be provided by the elders. Um, so come and join us for that uh, next Sunday during our wor regular worship service time. Uh, big thank you to those who helped with the golf outing, especially Jim and Dave. And I, I think they uh, raised a net total of just over 17000 right, Jim? Oh, a little over 18000 yeah. So thank you to everyone who prayed, who donated, who golfed, who worked on it, who volunteered. It's greatly, greatly appreciated. And we found out we had to buy a new refrigerator downstairs, so it came at just the right time, too. Yeah. Yep. All right. Any other announcements? Kyle. Notice he called them coat racks. He didn't call them cubbies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone wants to help Mr. M put the, uh, the shoe racks back into the hallway, we had them uh, stripped and waxed this past week. So uh, any help is greatly appreciated. Any other announcements? None? Then let's conclude the Bible verse of the month. Blessed are those who have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. God's blessings to you this week.